Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Hedder, and it's my honor and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's webinar presented by Dr. Miriam Nzoi. Um, Dr. Nzoi is a anthropologist with a PhD from Lumiere Lyon II University in France, where she earned it in 2020. Uh, she's been doing ethnological field work in Cambodia since 2013, and she's currently carrying it out in Mondo Curry, having previously worked in and around Phnom Penh. And I can say that CKS has provided some funding, at least, for her research. Um, her dissertation was on the anthropology of cancer in Cambodia, and she's continued to specialize in medical anthropology while also branching out into research on local ecological and biological knowledge, including work on human animal relationships, a topic with perhaps some intellectual linkages uh, to the anthropological work of Darcy D'Angelo on deminers and rats. Again, however, Miriam's current research focuses on the health behaviors of Benong people in two Mundo Kiri villages including their knowledge concerning body composition and their understanding of pathological processes. She's studying the latter in light of the fact that these villagers have no formal biomedical training. Uh, this points to the importance in her work of the concept of biomedicine. Uh, for those of you who like me may be coming to her topic with little or no familiarity, with the way in which this term is used, uh, a little explaining, I think, is in order. Fortunately, Miriam has given a wonderful explanation of it in her introduction to a 2021 edition of the journal Mousson, which is usefully also available in English. There, she succinctly defines biomedicine as medical practices based on Western-derived scientific medicine and suggests that its spread in Southeast Asia and elsewhere can perhaps be understood in terms of the globalization of therapeutic knowledge and the transnationalization of health. It's also important for me to report that the articles in this special issue present this not as a story about a dominant cultural group imposing itself on a dominated group, nor one about non-coercive exchange between them. Instead, at least some authors view is that the history of Western derived medicine in Southeast Asia shows its appropriation has been hybrid and that biomedicine has been transformed and adapted by local actors since its beginnings in the 19th century. Thus in this process, some Southeast Asian neo-traditional practitioners use biomedical objects and or techniques in their ritual, divinatory, diagnostic and or therapeutic processes. At the same time, the authors are at pains to interrogate any assumption that biomedicine as practiced in many instances in the West is some always superior and uniform, a unified form of scientific knowledge, especially with regard to how treatment is provided and how the relationship between the provider, the patient, and particular, and in particular the latter's family is articulated. Here, one of the most striking things is the way in which in Southeast and other parts of Asia, the family of the afflicted human being plays such an important role. I won't go any further about what's in the introduction and the articles, but I do, do hope people are intrigued enough to at least read Miriam's introduction in full for themselves. I would only add that the approach taken in some of these works reminds me of some classical pieces by historians, political scientists, and anthropologists focused on Southeast Asia. I am thinking, for example, of Cambodia historian Oliver Walters, who argued that Southeast Asians historically constructed what he called external news in terms that they made intelligible to themselves 
based on their previous experiences and beliefs. One which one might say is continued, uh, something which one might say is continued up into the presence to make them capable of perceiving and interpreting that news in particularly Southeast Asian ways. The political scientist Ben Anderson once similarly argued in favor of the powerful continuing impact of traditional political conceptions on contemporary politics in Java, pointing out how they were used to measure political legitimacy alongside Western concepts. There's also anthropologist Vicente Rafael's work on how Catholicism was ingested in the Philippines in ways that mixed it with indigenous beliefs and turned it into an anti-colonial ideology. Finally, the anthropologist Fenella Cannell once declared that nothing from the West is beyond Southeast Asians adaptive reach and moreover that they are perhaps particularly adept at, at self-transformative processes by which anything and everything in the world can be appropriated and performed. Uh, one might say that this is equally true not only for Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Marxism, liberalism, and human rights, but also for biomedicine. Now, such views have been critiqued, but also updated and or superseded, such as in political historian John Siddell's recent brilliant book on the cosmopolitan origins of Southeast Asian revolutionary movements. I do think they continue to contain insights about things that can be observed in Cambodia today, such as in Mondulkiri villages, where biomedicine is beginning to make news of its existence known. On that uh, retrospective note, I now turn things over to Dr. Mzui. Hi, everyone. Before starting, I would like to say thank you for all the CKS members and also Steve for making possible this webinar. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the health behaviors of Binong people who live in Mongolia. I came here in this beautiful province to learn how people conceptualize health and disease. Mongolkiri is a rural area in the northeast of Cambodia where live minority communities. The main one is called Bunong, also called Phnong. Bunong people are a distinct ethnic group who live in the mountain and who has a, their own language like most of ethnic groups in Cambodia. Most of them are farmers and still have a kind of traditional way of life. But, you know, during the last decade, a little bit more maybe, um, a lot of things changed because of population circulation, because of money, because of electricity and commodities. And also, because of Christianity conversion. I think uh, this province is also known to have a pretty cool weather and to face some environmental issues, such as deforestation. Okay, on this slide, I just, for me, it's a kind of illustration of the traditional modernity transition, because on the right side, we have a traditional Bunong house, and on the left, a Khmer house in a village, in the Bunong village. Um, for this presentation, I'm gonna begin with the purpose of my research. Then I'm going to explain my methodology. After that, I'm going to talk um, about my first findings. I'm going to give you an overview of health behaviors and a description 
of some natural remedies. Then I'm going deeper into the humoral qualities which are at stake during a therapeutic process. But don't worry, <laughs> I will be explaining uh, what humoral quality means. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19. Um, the whole research is about how the population in the northeast of Cambodia understands the body and the living and perceive pathogens and infections. First of all, my main goal was to understand what people do when they are sick. What kind of medicines and type of healing practices people are using? And also, how are these medicines linked? I see this subject through the concept of therapeutic landscape, which includes all kinds of knowledge and allows us to think that one, medical knowledge isn't limited to biomedicine. Two, healing practices can be provided by everyone. And three, spiritual practices could heal too. I, for my methodology, first, I would like to say thank you uh, to everyone who helped me these last past few months, especially Frédéric Bourdieu and Nicolas Savagnon. For this research, I conducted 27 interviews. Most, most of them um, were with women during the day and the whole family uh, during in the evening. I worked with a Khmer teacher five hours per week to help me in my, uh, with my Khmer, of course, but also um, with my interview speeches and questions. And I also needed to find someone who speak Bunong and English to work with for a long time. Even though I had to change several times before finding someone invaluable and interested uh, in social research, I finally got it. So I told you that I'm interested in body perceptions. However, um, if you want to study this topic, you can't just ask directly about it, you know? For example, if I ask, uh, what kind of body representation do you have? Nobody can answer this in any language. So I need to let people speak about their body in context because we all have a specific body representation. And a good way to study it can be disease, food, medication, and so on. In fact, I studied remedies not only as a part of you know, culture, but also to better understand Cambodian knowledge of the body. And, you know, speaking about remedies is the best way to study humoral qualities. But what does that mean? Okay. Humoral qualities are linked with body perception. There are different kinds of humoral theories all around the world, especially in Southeast Asia and South America. In Cambodia, the ancient traditional Khmer medicine had various influences, such as Ayurveda and Chinese medicine. This means that disease is seen as humors unbalanced in the body. And also that natural elements 
are involved in both disease and body perceptions. Body functions. To be clear, humors means body liquid. And this theory often implies the hot cold concept. Through these concepts, disease can bring too much heat or too much cold to the body. It's the reason why the purpose of a medication, remedies, or food will be to fix it. Also, this perception could be linked with wind inside and outside the body. Here, the healing process means restoring balance. And everything you eat could help you to do this. When you study folk medicine practices, you realize that explanation and classification depend on people, context, and so on. So we can't, we can't have a strong classification where everyone agrees, but only a soft one. And if you, if you are interested in it, I wrote a paper a few years ago about food classification during cancer disease. And I put other references in the bibliography at the end of my presentation. OK, um, just to give you an overview of health practices. We can say that um, there are both biomedicine, such as drugstores, hospitals, and medical offices, and another kind of medicine, commonly uh, called traditional medicine. But that medicine can include really several kinds of therapeutic knowledge, perceived, but not really, but perceived as ancient, in opposite to modern medicine. This implies a lot of invisible health behavior and spirituality as well. To be specific, we know people used to make some sacrificial offerings when someone is sick. I'll talk more about it further. And as an anthropologist, um, I'm interested in how are used this kind of medicine. To be clear, uh, there is no pattern, but only some specificities. People here, as well as everywhere in Cambodia, I assume so, self-medicate. Um, most of them rotate between pharmaceutical drugs and homemade remedies. Oh, they mix both. Bunon people uh, used to see a specialist commonly after making a sacrificial ceremony if the health issue persists. In a nutshell, people navigate the medical landscapes by themselves. By themselves. It's why I called this self-governance. So let's uh, dive into natural remedies. Um, it's really not the only way to treat, but I decided to focus on for this webinar. People here um, use the plant from the garden, the village, and the forests. And if they can't find it, they buy it from another village. From the field, I okay, just okay. From the field, I gathered three distinct, one of ingredients, one of the ways to treat, and one of health issues. Um honestly, a health issue 
could be treated by various ways. That means that one plant can be prepared differently for the same purpose or different purposes by the same person or different people. Therefore, most of remedies are different. There are various kinds of plants and combinations of plants. Normally, a combination contains three or four plants. One plant can have different therapeutic attributes, qualities, and the quantity is barely mentioned. I collected 68 recipes, but 87 possibility, possibilities to use them with 49 ingredients, six main ways to treat with these ingredients, and eight categories of health issues. I'm gonna explain all my findings now. Okay. This table shows the plants most quoted and used. I, I couldn't find out all the 49 ingredients because I got most of the name in Gunong. And it was really difficult, you know, uh, for, some of, for some of them to have a Khmer or an English translation. And so because one plant can have different names in Bunong, depending on the area. So I decided to not waste my time and just focus on the most quoted plants. For some of them, I'm not sure about uh, the specific name, so I put an asterisk. As you can see, some of these plants are really common, such as guava, lemon, ginger, or lemongrass. And the most quoted plant is tam red, which is a dam comprehensive in Khmer. As you can see, this plant grows everywhere. I saw it near the houses, on the street in the village. This picture was taken just outside the house. And palm rep is considered as an invasive species. There are several common names in English, but I think the most popular is siamweed. The plant looks like this. Um, we also have another plant called Blanco in Bunong. It's the second most quoted plant. It's a specific kind of lemongrass called slug clay cube in Khmer. It's different. Uh, this plant is different from lemongrass, just uh, called blank. Unlike the first one, Mlanku became really rare in the villages. This picture was taken in the only garden where we can find it in one of the two villages. And so everyone comes to the same place to get this plant. And here uh, we have Tam Raman, commonly known as a family of cashew. And as you can see, it's interesting because different parts of this tree can be used, the bark as the leaf. I also put, um, I also put Slug trobike, guava tree, because it's really common and it grows everywhere. Okay, um, so I told you that I told you that I collected various ways to treat health issues. Most remedies are decoctions and tisane, which means boiling water, but uh, boiling plants with water. But I was surprised by the number of hot showers and also inhalations, uh, cold drink to in inhalations. I think it could be linked with humoral qualities because the purpose of a remedy is to balance the body. And I also observed some poultices, uh, poultice and showers, uh, cold or cold or hot, and so on. Um, 
after organizing my findings, I observed that hot showers, season, and um, inhalations are frequently a combination of plants. Conversely, cold drinks, cool teas, and cold showers are more often a single ingredient. And so I've ate recipes for inhalation, but gathering 30 plants. So which means that this, this way um, is the most sophisticated way to combinate plants, the most sophisticated treatment. OK, when you study health issues, sometimes it's really complicated. Because everyone describes their symptoms, aches, pains, feelings, emotions, and so on differently. So, and when you work in three languages, <laughs> the non queer and English, uh, which I translate in my mind in French, you know, uh, sometimes there is no equivalence. For example, um, there is no word in the non to say the clue. So I tried to organize health issues by categories, even though I know that this kind of it's, it's kind of artificial. I grouped together body issues to see if plants had specific purposes. These are all ingredients and the reason why they are used. I need more time to treat the data. But I can already say that, as we can see, Melancho is mentioned in everything except stomach ache. So it covers a wide spectrum of issues. On the opposite, some ingredients have a specific purpose. For example, worms and leeches, which are the only animals mentioned, are used for high fever and cold. It's the same for guava tree and another plant called tam crop in Bunong, um, Sandai Kai in Khmer, which are only for stomach pain. This is tam crop or Sandai, Sandai uh, Kai. In English, it's commonly known as Sasha Inchi or Sasha Peanut. I also put the scientific name uh, on the slide. Okay, um, what way for, for, for what purpose, you know? Um, I just want to show you the different ways to cure for different purposes. For example, for the flu or a serious cold, um, it's more hot showers. For cold, is cold drinks. But for both, there are inhalations as well. And as you can see, for fever is more cold showers, for stomach ache is uh, decoctions, definitely. Uh, for headache is more poultice, for cold is more inhalation, injury is poultice. And for COVID, it's interesting because uh, you have decoctions, but a lot of inhalations as well. Um, with all of my data, I've already observed a few patterns. Um, first one, Mlanku and Ja, Ja is ginger in Bunong, uh, are only uh, inhalations used. And worms and leeches fit together for drinking. But for the other ingredients, there are too many combinations to see a real pattern. On another side, tam rep, which is the most quoted plant, has different purposes or qualities, depending on the way it is used. If it's a poultice, or uh, if it's a poultice is for injury, if it's shower or drink, is more against the flu. As I said before, there are some specific remedies 
and some wide spectrum remedies. For example, um, I noticed that pineapple leaves, pineapple leaves are used to cure only children's disease. Um, and uh, with all the remedies I've collected, I noticed that COVID is mainly treated as a flu and shares some plants with fever and cold, which, you know, makes sense. But there, there is a higher number of inhalations for COVID than for the flu. I assume that this high number is related to respiratory difficulties, which are more important when you have COVID than the flu. Um, so, how I can link all of this data with the humoral theory? In this theory, the taste of a plant is really important because most of therapeutic qualities are explained by it. For example, for stomach ache, I heard several people say that we must drink the water from the tree, Tam Ralei, because it's bitter. And it's the same for other plants. I can say that bitter taste is medicine for stomach ache. On the other hand, sour reduces pain. And this taste is perceived as para for paracetamol, which is a painkiller. Also, um, the sour taste helps to avoid swelling because it sees as something which helps uh, blood flow. And um, I also have uh, I uh, also heard uh, other information uh, about uh, on tastes as uh, sweet taste and uh, spicy taste. In the picture, um, we have tam plong. Someone explained to me that this plant is a good cure to COVID for the COVID. Um, if you add, only if you add another plant, uh, which is tam core, because tam plong has a strong bitter taste, which is good for high fever, and tam core has a sweet taste, which is, which is good for cough. And I think this example uh, can show us what, how uh, the humoral quality um, could be linked uh, with plants on the field. So, as you can see uh, on the slide, uh, I put other purpose in, in the brackets because most of the time, when someone explains a quality, the qualities of the attributes of a plant or a taste, it isn't, you know, it isn't simple, clear, unique, uh, but generally is ambiguous and multiple. Also, um, the humoral theory is linked with the hot cold concept, which has which has the goal to balance the body. Hot and cold doesn't really mean hot and cold like warm and cool. For example, inhalation, which is hot water, is perceived as a cool method. That being said, most of the diseases are hot. And the purpose is to chill the body. In that way, Mlanku appears like a cool plant against the fever. Therefore, when you want to balance the body, you use the paste. For example, to avoid, you avoid the sweet and oily taste, taste uh, which are hot food when you have the flu. Before ending uh, my presentation with some information on COVID-19, I would like to quickly discuss the reason uh, for being sick. During all interviews I did with belong people who are not converted to Christianity, the spirits were almost always mentioned as an explanation to get sick. It's a wide 
and complicated topic that I don't want to misconstrue or reduce. I'm just gonna to introduce it. Um, there are different kinds of spirits that are involved in health issues. And that could be dead spirits or eating spirits. It's a kind of angry spirit that eats the spirit of the soul of humans. In that case, um, the sickness cannot be cured. Overall, doing wrong with traditional rules and making the spirits angry are the most common explanation for health issues. When this happens, the non people must make a ceremony. The sicker a person is, the greater um, yeah, the greater will be the sacrifice. For minor health, uh, for minor health issues, people must sacrifice a chicken. But if it gets stronger, people must sacrifice a pig. And if someone has a serious illness, it's a buffalo. In the picture, it was a buffalo because my neighbor was really sick. I didn't, um, I didn't translate all my interviews yet, but I heard an interesting, an interesting story of a woman, of a woman who had explained that she had a lot of problems before changing her religion, and her diabetes was solved by uh, conversion to Christianity. Here, I think it's a classical anthropological idea where sickness is linked to misfortune and the right, the right cure is to choose the right God. I think it's maybe the same psycholo, uh, psychosocial mechanism or pattern for Bunong who are animists and for Bunong people who are Christian. Both, both tend to explain sickness as the wrong way to, life, to live and healing as the right order. You know, as a medical anthropologist, I'm interested in what people are doing during this pandemic. And before, when someone had an infectious disease, the whole family went to the farm to be isolated and don't spread the disease uh, to the village. But nowadays, sick people with serious symptoms go to the hospital. But during this pandemic, sick people without serious symptoms went to the farm. However, conversely, when there were some cases of COVID-19 in one of the villages, some healthy families went to the farm to escape the disease and came back to buy basic supplies only. Uh, and some of them spent more than two months on the farm. Also, in a village that mostly converted to Christianity, when a whole classroom has been infected by the virus, the families and the pastor decided to host all the children of all the children in the church for more, for more than two weeks to prevent the spreading in the whole village. And uh, to conclude with my primary findings, I heard a story. I heard that villagers know about COVID-19 for a long time because this disease has a long story here and used to come back every three or five years during the dry cold season. People who say that uh, also mentioned that COVID-19 is more dangerous for Khmer than for Binong, for Khmer Lu than for Khmer Sandan, and for villagers, uh, for, and so no, and for townsmen than villagers. Because the second ones know how to take care and cure this kind of disease 
but not the primary, the primary ones. I just want to add that the main explanation for having COVID-19 is not the spirit, but the wind, which is maybe partly connected to the humoral theory. theory. Thank you, everyone. And I put my thank you much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we do have uh, some questions in the in the Q and A box, so I'll I'll start start with them. Um, first question is, how is knowledge passed on? Knowledge of treatment passed on from one generation to the next? Oh. It's really, really interesting, sorry, um, Christian. Um, honestly, I don't have enough data to really answer on this question. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried about this, about the, you know, how the knowledge um, passed a generation on generation, because I think uh, now uh, not everyone, but some uh, young people go uh, in Phnom Penh or move out of the village. And I'm not sure that um, there is a real transmission. And I think a lot of knowledge is now just um, it's, it's lost, but I think it's just a supposition. And because I'm not really an expert on, I, I just, I came here a uh, few months uh, ago and I need more time to, to better answer this question. But I think we have to worry about this, I guess. I, guess so. I don't see the answer. <laughs> so I'll go on to the second question, which goes sort of straight back to the things that I talked about on your behalf, as it were, in the introduction. So the question is, uh, to what extent uh, is there still remaining use of traditional treatment as opposed to turning to the use of what's here called modern treatment? Um, I think uh, I, I focus on this presentation uh, on um, remedies, but I think people here um, if they can afford it, they they go to the hospital. Like they, they definitely, when someone has a serious uh, injury or a serious illness, people go to the hospital and use biomedicine. But even though uh, they before did a ceremony, you know, you can do bo both. You know, I think um, I. I read uh, a scientific um, a, a paper a few months ago about someone who explained that I think in Southeast Asia, and the, the, this paper was about Indonesia, but I think it makes really sense here uh, too. People don't do one thing or another. People do everything, you know. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can use um, biomedicine and also remedies and also ceremonies. I think it's more, you know, everything is, uh, it's a combination of everything than one or another. Okay, very good. Um, we have, I think, a kind of related question that's come to me via chat. Um, and I think you've dealt with some of this already, but it needs perhaps following up. First part of the question is, do Benong, pe do Benong people believe in the existence of COVID-19? And maybe you can elaborate on what you've already said about that. And the second is kind of a follow-up to the one we just addressed. Have the known people followed all the prevention and treatment measures recommended by the government? Slightly different version of the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just say, okay. Um, two things for the existence of the COVID. I think, yeah, every, um, here, People, I think, was really afraid about uh, COVID-19, and some people was really afraid. And some others told me that um, 
they know this disease um, has existed really for a long time and they know the symptoms, the aches, the pains, uh, everything uh, comes from COVID and they know how to cure it. So for them, um, COVID-19 is not a new virus, is not a new disease, it's not, it is something they used to uh, have and they know how to cure it. Mm, but, you know, I, I tell you, it's just, um, I hear this, but I think it's not, not everyone uh, around me uh, thinks that. And I, maybe I need yet to, to point that a lot of people here were afraid and make ceremony to protect, uh, to prevent uh, from this virus. So, and the, the second one about um, about um, policies and uh, how people here uh, follow follow government uh, policies. I think uh, I arrived after uh, the because I arrived in the, um, November, something like that. So it was after main restrictions, um, and but I hear that people uh, used to have their own rules, like to go to, to the farm when you, when you are sick, to not spread the disease. But um, if, if the question is about uh, wear a mask um, or uh, keep distance, I, I think people were, because I, you know, I have a story. I, I think it's only in Cambodia or some, uh, some country like this. You can see someone in a motorbike without uh, wearing a cask, but with a mask. And yeah, I, I, I saw a lot of people with a mask and the, the mask was really was used. But for the other thing, when people, people live together, so for social distance, it is really difficult, but like other parts in Cambodia, is I think it's really difficult to to keep distance with everyone. But I think people here yeah, follow the uh, most of the rules. Very good, very good. Uh, I have another question come in on the Q and A, and that's: Have you found anything interesting specific to women's issues, such as pregnancy, menopause, and the like? Um, I think uh, I didn't focus on it also because there, uh, I, there is um, some references on this topic already and uh, people don't speak to me, um, uh, don't speak about it to me, but yes and no, because I have uh, I, I try to remember um, uh, because for women people, but I think it's the same for men. Uh, some uh, crew uh, used to have some specific uh, kind of uh, remedies or therapeutics just only for women uh, after uh, during pregnancy or after delivery. So, but I I didn't focus on it. Uh, maybe it could be another research. Something like that. Thank you. Uh, here's, a, here's another question, which in, I, I suppose, in a sense, also relates to the, 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 the issue of biomedicine versus not biomedicine, uh, but from a rather different perspective. Uh, and the question is, do the recipes that you've described um, have recognition or protection or licensing by outsiders? And I don't, I'm not quite sure I under, fully understand the question, but I, I think part of the question is about commercialization of traditional medicines and practices or government, government recognition of the, the, the value of, 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 of that kind of thing. So a kind of reverse, reverse flow of, 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 of the traditional into the bureaucratic state capitalist modernity. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Um, I'm not sure, but I think, in my opinion, but maybe I'm wrong because, you know, I cannot just know everything. Uh, but I think for, uh, I told you about Tam Rep and Mlangu, the two most participants. Uh, I think there is no um, any recognition, uh, any, um, yeah, any laboratory or any anything. I think it just, I don't find it. But uh, it's interesting because the sub, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it's a sub, for some, uh, some like Kai uh, Tamkop, um, I forget the name in English. Uh, I, there is a woman with a, with your hands and uh, you can see um, the, the plants inside uh, on my slides. These plants, I just hear yesterday from a friend, he told me that um, five years ago, this plant doesn't exist here. And now everyone used to use it because it came from some, um, some people that they came here and say, oh, this plant can cure everything. So, and, it's for stomach ache, but thank you for stomach ache. So you have to use it. And the, I think it's an interesting topic because I have I heard um, different stories on people who hear about a remedies which brings with, I think, a company, or um, not a company, but you know, it's not just one one person who it's um, who wants to, to to sell uh, some remedies. And I think in Cambodia, the, because in my last research, when I uh, went to the hospital to to with uh, to study uh, cancer, everyone used to make tisan with a uh, slug tip barang, uh, slug tip barang, which is um, corosol. I I know in French. I don't know in English. Uh, it makes sense corosol for you. A plant, uh, but it's a plant. Uh, in Khmer, is slug tip barang, and slug tip barang uh, is used by everyone uh, in in cancer yards. But I think it's just you know um, because someone say, okay, this plant can to cure every, to cure the cancer, and everyone uh, start to use it. And I think it's the same for some plants here, like like uh, tamcop which is uh, some guy, uh, some like uh, guy. But for the other one, uh, like I said, um, Tam Rep and Rangpu, so the two most uh, quoted plants, uh, I think there is no um, medical proof or no, but maybe uh, I'm, I'm not sure about it. I think we, we actually have a question related to what you just said. Um, and the question is, while you were in the field, uh, did you experience, uh, observe uh, people who were attempting to use these traditional methods for dealing with light sickness, headaches and colds and, and such? Um, I think the question is, the question is literally, how, what did you think about those remedies? I, maybe uh, if the question is, does it work? <laughs> Any evidence that it works? And uh, do you have an opinion on whether or not it works? Um, okay, I think, you know, um, I don't know if it's uh, only uh, some kind of anthropologist or, or all anthropologists, but I, I'm not used to focus of uh, it's working or not, it's right or not. For me, it's, but I can answer this. My neighbor, when my neighbor is sick, she used to to cure uh, herself by plants. And I came one time; she was sick. She took the medicines, and she um, become better after this. So maybe it's. But honestly, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's really cure like you know, like a Western point of view, like a scientific point of view. But for me, I think there is some, you know, um, every drugs come from plants, most of them. So there is some qualities, attributes, and if you think it's, it's worth, 
I don't know why it's. Um, uh, I think it could be working, you know, uh, and and for sacrifice because I uh, yeah I also uh, see a sacrifice. I think it's part of culture, and there um, there are some interesting literature on uh, how um, you how your mind when you believe in something uh, can help you to make it um, functionable. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, even even a, a medical, uh, even a paracetamol, um, sometimes it could not work if you think it, it will not work. So I think it's not just scientific or beliefs, but everything fits together. And sometimes, yeah, a drug can work or not uh, if uh, you believe it or not. I don't know if it really makes sense, but I think it's, it's not. I think I'm like, you know, you put all together and everything <laughs> will be okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we have another a follow a Q and A question. Um, and that was one that I was also actually wondering about um, how the known people reacted to or what they thought of the vaccine. Are there a lot of anti-vaxxers okay. up there um, or not? I just, because now the, the weather is better, so I... <laughs> um, I think... Um, uh, I know that my neighbors are vaccinated uh, twice. Yeah, twice. Um, and I, I don't really focus on it, but now I have some regrets, so I think maybe I will. So I'm going to talk with my neighbors to know <laughs> what do you think about the uh, vaccination? Um, but I think, you know, it, it's like um, policy. They follow the rules. And because also, I came in Cambodia in August, and when I arrived here, I see really a difference with France. Well, French people are maybe not the best, but I think French people, for them, the COVID is just not for everyone, and but it's just like something um, not really the same. But uh, I don't see really people afraid about it. When I arrived here, I see a lot of people uh, put, put um, um, how do you say it in English? When you, when you... Spray? Uh, yeah, spray me to uh, disinfect me before. To, and I say, oh, come on, come on. And not too much because I, and, and I think, but maybe I'm wrong, but I think in Cambodia, people are a little bit more afraid than other people. Uh, but around the world and they follow they like um when i was um when i work on my last topic you know i also uh, understand that Khmer people love injection inject injections and the same remedies if you take it um by uh, with a pill or by injection everyone prefer injection because it works better it's, it's it, and i think it's, it's like like for it's the same with um, with vaccination. People like to be vaccinated. In France, uh, people doesn't like it, you know, really. Uh, but here, I think people like to be vaccinated. I it's my opinion. I, I don't think I, I don't say that I'm really I'm, I'm sure of it, but it's my inter interpretation. Ah, we have another question come in. So well, that's that question. So from what I can see, unless somebody can see something that I can't see, that is the last question in the Q&A and the nothing more in the chat. So then it's my turn. Um, two questions. 
Um, are, are you yet in a position to, to make any kind of comparison, contrast between what's done among the Benong and what's done among lowland Khmer with regard to these kinds of methods and treatments? Mm, not really, because uh, on my previous research, it was more about uh, people who had cancer, but it was just one disease. So uh, it's quite different. And in this research, everyone, the food was really important. And, mm. um, and the humors, uh, the humor theory through, uh, throughout uh, the, the food was really important. Here, maybe, and uh, I'm not sure that this is my opinion, but uh, maybe an opinion from a friend who used to live here really um, uh, for 10 years. Um, he told me that for him, Benong people, you know, there is really um, not an acculturation because maybe the word is too strong. Uh, but Benong people, there is a, um, now they they act that they live a kind of Khmer lifestyle, not really. But and maybe it's uh, the Khmer belief uh, about uh, humoral theory, but it, it's a, it's it's a supposition. And maybe it's the Khmer belief about um, humoral theory who passed through uh, to uh, Bunong people. Because I'm not for me, I'm not really sure that Bunong people uh, had really a strong humoral theory uh, before. Uh, to have a lot of connection with um, Khmer people. Okay, and uh, one other question. Um, anything at all about what happens with these practices and methods during the Khmer Rouge period? Uh, uh, no. Okay. I'm, no, I, I didn't, but I think there is maybe some book. I have a book. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, maybe there is some book uh, on uh, Khmer Rouge, but I, I didn't make a research on it. Right. Okay. Um, I, I, I think we're, that's, we've taken care of all the questions now, so I think we can, we can wrap it up. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, one wonderful set of slides and a great presentation. And Thank you so uh, much. I, are you going to continue with this work? You, you, um, you... Honestly, I start to begin another project. Right. But, and uh, you uh, on uh, about rats. What Cambodia uh -huh. with rat with rats in Cambodia? So you know, it's more than human animal relationship. And I'll, I'll have to ask the question that academics always have to ask other academics. Is there going to be a publication based on this? Um, on uh, this research and the other one. Yes, on this, on the, on what, on the presentation you've uh, the same um, a written version of what you presented in a slide yeah. version today. Um, now I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe we look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. We hope there will be. <laughs>